I need to share with you today a great irony in our day and age. We all know that in education there's too much testing, right? Everybody talks about it. Testing is being dumped on teachers left and right, especially in the U.S. Have you heard about this? Are you experiencing it? It's so true and it's over, uh, it's overdone and it is killing us. And yet the irony is with all that testing, we're missing out as reading teachers on the most important tests we could give our kids. And that's what I want to talk about tonight here at Reading Simplified. I'm Dr. Marnie Ginsberg, and I want to share with you the number one test you need to give any beginning reader or any struggling reader to find out if they have a problem or what problem they have and to most likely zero in on the solution. I have talked about this here before Reading Simplified, but many have joined us recently, particularly to learn about the, the activity Switch It in the Level Up Your Reader's Achievement in the Next Five Days Challenge, which we had a few weeks back, and you can see um, what people found in, um, in their experience of that challenge on this page here at Facebook. So if you've been following us, some of this may be something from the, you've heard. It may not be as much of a surprise to you. But for many of us, it will be a big surprise because like I said, we're being bombarded by tests, but we're not getting the tests that we really need to be able to diagnose our kiddos. Again, whether they are beginners or they are struggling readers who are in third grade or who are 13 or they are adults, most likely they're just giving, they're just getting comprehension assessment, right? That's what you get for kids in second grade and up in year three and up. <clears throat> you get comprehension test outcomes, but that doesn't really tell you what the root of the problem is. So I would love for you to share with me what you, um, what your concerns are about testing in reading. Do you think there's too much? Are you missing some of the puzzle? Some schools are giving tests uh, left and right, but again, they're not getting to the root of the problem. So do you want to hear what the, the number one test is? Let me talk about it with you soon. But first, let's see who's here. Hey, Debbie um, and Stella and Ileana. Welcome. I'm so glad you guys are here. And if you're just popping in, Say hello, tell me where you're from. We're gonna be talking about the most important test you can give for any beginning reader or any struggling reader. Okay, so what happens most of the time with second graders, third graders, all the way up seventh graders, eighth graders, high schoolers, at the end of the year, we get an end of grade assessment and it's a comprehension test. And if our kids don't score on grade level or they don't get a four, or they don't reach a certain percentile, or they don't get a three, then we say that they have a comprehension problem. They're not comprehending on grade level. And true enough, they are not able to reach that standard. But is it because they have poor comprehension, poor reasoning of how to think about text, or is there something else going on? And how would you know? Because frankly, all you get is a level how they compare with other kids their age. So it doesn't really, tell you what the root of the problem is. And in reading, most of the time, the problem is not primarily comprehension. They may definitely need to be enhanced in their comprehension, and that may need to be a secondary or a tertiary thing to focus on, but most of the time, that's not the real problem. So the testing reveals a, a lacking, but it doesn't re reveal the true nature of the problem. It's like a doctor who um, is given just one measure. The doctor who's given a, uh, the information of this patient's temperature. So the doctor knows, oh, this patient has a fever. Well, uh, just because the patient has a fever doesn't mean that you, the doctor knows what the diagnosis should be, right? It could be an ear infection. It could be strep throat. It could be some advanced 
autoimmune disease. It could be probably many other things that I don't know enough about to, to, to guess on, right? So that is the same thing as a comprehension test. Um, yes, there's a problem. The patient has a fever. Yes, there's a problem. The student can't read on grade level. But what is the source of the problem? Is the, is the fever um, because of a, some sort of virus? Is it because of a bacteria? What do we do because of that fever? We gotta get more testing. And so even though we're being bombarded by testing, ironically, we're not choosing the test that's probably gonna give us the most valuable information. So, um, Ileana, you're in, um, you're originally from Romania, but you're in S South Carolina for the past 16 years. I didn't know that, that's really cool. And Candace is coming in all the way from Australia. Welcome, Candace. So if you guys have some concerns about testing in reading, or if you have questions, let me know. So I'm talking about this mismatch between what we're being told to give and the information that we really need. So when we know that a student's reading below grade level, we don't know the source of the problem. There's so many things that could be wrong. They could have a fluency problem. They could not have, they could have a background knowledge vocabulary problem. They could have a word identification problem. They could have more specifically a decoding, a sound-based decoding problem. Um, they could have a language problem that is more related to comprehension. And, um, and then there could be other things that could be going on. So when we give the global measure of comprehension test, um, we don't know what the real root of the problem is. And so I see patients, patients, <laughs> I see students all the time who, um, whose teachers think that they have a comprehension problem. And, t and the parents think they have a comprehension problem too because they get the test and it says comprehension, not at grade level. But really, that's rarely the main thing. So the main thing for most students after working with kids for 20 years, I see this over and over again, it's 99% of the time true that when kids are behind in reading, they have poor sound-based decoding because that is the foundation for building up the ability to read well. And when those kids have poor sound-based decoding, their word identification can be a little sluggish, maybe not quite as accurate as they could be. And then the next level of problems beyond that would be then maybe their fluency is a little slower and a little sluggish than it should be. So you build up all these kind of challenges that after that foundation is weak or crumbly. And by the time they get up to the higher level skill of comprehension with all these things that are weak and crumbly, yes, they have a problem with comprehension, but it's, it could be that it's not the real main thing that we need to focus on. But if we go to the root of the problem and focus on what's the true problem, then we can make a big difference for our kids. So how do you find out if sound-based decoding is the main problem? Do you guys know, especially if you've been here for a while, you probably have heard me talk about it. Maybe many of you already give tests like this. But a lot of teachers are, are hamstrung. They don't have this information. So does anyone have a guess? I know there's a little bit of a time lag, but the answer is, let's see if I, the answer, oh, the answer is to determine if a student has weak sound-based decoding, we should give the student a word attack test, um, also known as a nonsense word test or a non-word test. Have you seen those before? Have you given them yourself? They're not um, a full measure of what reading consists of, obviously. They're not real words. And yet, when we give that nonsense word reading measure, we can deduce how poor or strong the foundation is of, of reading, which is truly sound-based decoding. Okay, we've got some guesses here. You guys are, are awesome. Um, I Yes, you are right, um, Heather. It, the sound-based decoding will be related to phonemic awareness, so you're totally right, as will Leah letter sounds. Totally right. Those are both going to be implicated in the, um, or sh revealed in the sound-based decoding measure or a word attack test. 
and Ileana, yes, spelling will also reveal a lot of that. You guys are all over it. And Heather is also changing nonsense word fluency. So that is a, um, if you're particularly talking about the dibbles, that would be one type of nonsense word test. And it can be a great marker, particularly for kindergarten and first graders. But as the kids move on, it can be um, insufficient because it's only, I think it's typically just three sounds. And so if, how do you, if a student can uh, decode four sound words or multisyllable words, we still don't really know it from that test. But that still is a very good test um, for those early grades. So that's what we need to be giving. When we have beginning readers, so... I would test everybody K2 with this, or we have anyone who's struggling with reading, give them a nonsense word test, a word attack test, okay? Now, I happen to be able to give the Woodcock Johnson reading mastery test at your schools. You may have other resources like that, but if you don't have access to norm reference standardized tests like that, then I'm gonna suggest that you can, um, find something that is free. It will not be quite as precise, but it'll still be helpful. If you go to this website, this is my blog, readingsimplified.com. If you head over there at forward slash reading dash tests, you'll be able to see some free standardized tests that will measure nonsense word reading. And when you get that, and check it out for a kid that you're worried about. I, I bet you a dollar they're going to have a gap between their age and maybe even their overall reading level and that word attack score. So I wanted to share with you two case studies of students I worked with last year that really dramatically revealed this. But over and uh, they're, they're very dramatic in their story, but it's also very dramatic that as a tutor across 20 years, I've only seen one or two kids who don't have this profile of reading achievement at a certain level and the nonsense word reading test or the word attack test being far below their ability, uh, their grade, and their overall reading achievement. And when we do a little bit of sound-based decoding, everything goes back up and in fact it surpasses and um, their reading achievement as it was and goes up to grade level and beyond. So I'm going to share with you those stories. Okay. Awesome. Uh, Heather. Yes. You're, so you're using that nonsense word fluency. It's, are you, what, what level um, do you teach Heather? So let me dive into these case studies. All right. So the first one is actually a story of, um, enrichment. So this young girl was not struggling. She's a fourth grader and look at that test. If you can read it, it says eighth grade for passage comprehension and seventh, four, um, seventh grade, fourth month for another passage comprehension test. So I happened to give her two. One was like a whole passage and then the Woodcock Johnson was just short sentences like a closed test. So <clears throat> what was interesting was that th those are the two tests I gave. She also had at school the MAP test and um, she scored at the 86th percentile for that but her mother wanted her to do better and her mother also realized that her spelling and her writing was weak and that her attention was weak and the teacher actually thought that in class when the student was being asked different things about what they were doing that the student showed poor comprehension so something was off with this child even though she was a fourth grade girl functioning way above grade level in her comprehension but notice how impressive it was that she was comprehending up here, but her wor word identification was like a fourth grader. So she was actually just a couple months below her age uh, for word identification. And then I also gave her the spelling test, and that one is pretty commensurate with her word identification, which is very common. But here was the red flag, and this is why I want, to, this is why I'm cho chose this as a case study. Guess what her word attack was. Here is a child who's in fourth grade, able to comprehend like a seventh or eighth grader, uh, but still kind of scattered in class, and something seems to be off with literacy. Uh, what do you think her word attack scores were? I know you couldn't possibly know, but just if you have, if, just to have some fun, let's throw out some numbers, okay? And then I will have the gray grand reveal. So it's a fourth grade girl 
what is her ability, what level uh, do you think may be her word attack ability? And while we wait for that, we will hear from Miss Leah. She says she works with a fifth grade student who is at a second grade level, classic. Would this be good for her? She's been on an IEP for the last two years and has not made progress. Oh yes, Leah, please give her this test. Absolutely. I'm I'm 99% sure that at least she has a problem with sound-based decoding and that the nonsense word test would reveal that. Okay, so we've got some good guesses here. Thanks for playing my game. Leah's guessing second grade, good guess. And Ileana's guessing between this 15 and 25th percentile. It's probably right, but I don't have percentiles. Okay, here we go. Here's the big reveal. <clears throat> this fourth grade girl who could comprehend like an eighth grader was at the second grade level for word attack. I don't know how she had survived school with so many holes in her system. And so no wonder she was sometimes scattered. No wonder her spelling and her writing were not what her parents thought were her potential. And no wonder her teacher was confused that she had an 86 percentile for the map test, which is a comprehension measure, but things weren't quite happening well for her in class. This is so classic. She had been masking her ability, her poor word identification and poor word attack because she has incredible reasoning abilities and she was compensating, but it was a struggle. Okay, so what we did was a classic reading simplified with this fourth grade girl. I met with her um, about every other week for six weeks for an hour initially. And I did classic reading simplified activities like switch it, a little bit of read it, and then a lot of sort it. And then she read really challenging text, but I coached her on how to help her read it. So I made sure she blended as she read and um, learned the phonics information, which she had a big gap there. You don't come up with a second grade word attack as a um, middle to end of the year fourth grader and not have some pretty weak phonics knowledge. Okay, so guess what happens when you just give a student fill in the cracks of the sound-based decoding foundation. Okay, let's, <clears throat> sorry for my frog in my throat. <clears throat> we will reveal what happens to this young girl. Okay. So, uh, whoops, sorry about that. Here she is, fourth grade girl with this 2.0 word attack, but we worked together for six weeks. Remember, she's it's an enrichment case. Her mom's concerned, but this is not a dire situation. So after six hours, I give her a test to see, maybe we don't need to work anymore. And her passage comprehension goes up. Remember, it was already pretty dang high, uh, 7.4 for the Woodcock Johnson, and it went up 1.1 grade level after those six hours. And uh, it went up 1.8 grade levels uh, for the word attack. So it was up to grade level after just six hours because that was something that was really missing for her and reading simplified activities really targeted it precisely. So how does that sound to you guys? Would that be um, a good reason to give this kind of test? What do you think? If you could get a kid who is two or three years behind in word attack up to years in a couple of weeks or several weeks is a little about two months would that be a game changer for that kid and it was probably a game changer for the classroom teacher because the child wasn't so scatterbrained and we got a lot better um, reports back from the classroom environment after that and the student became uh, more interested in writing and the students writing became better everything was more uh, in the flow after that, because we, we realized that there was a big hole, a gaping hole there for her in her sound-based decoding. And it was the nonsense word test that revealed it. And Heather says, this is uh, definitely a good plan for her. Okay, how about another case study? This one's even more dramatic, if you can believe that. <laughs> I've got a 15 year old, okay. And this 15 year old boy had been struggling in school his whole life and his mom had tried to find out 
uh, what to do to help him, but was never really that successful at figuring what to do out. Finally, she got him tested by a psychologist, an educational psychologist, and the psychologist revealed that he had dyslexia. So he's 15 years old, he was a freshman, and his passage comprehension was like a fifth grader. His word identification was uh, like an eighth grader, so he was at the 37th percentile. So he was compensating pretty well, but it, was be, it would be a struggle because he was at least one or probably two years behind. And his reading rate was also slow. And again, um, let's play the guessing game again. What do you think this young man's word attack was? He got identified as dyslexic. He was functioning like a fifth grader in comprehension, but higher in word identification. But he's in high school. He's a freshman. He's struggling, probably making C's and B's, maybe more C's than B's, but not enjoying school. What was his word attack? It's kind of staggering. If you've been in my workshop, three activities a day to keep reading difficulties away, I've already shared this guy's test, a uh, little case study. So. I'm going to give a few more seconds. Leah's got a good guess. Sixth grade, right, because it's two years below the word identification. Uh, that's right. And Debbie's got a good guess, too. 4.0, Ileana, third or fourth. All good guesses. That's probably what I would have guessed, too. But check this out, ladies <laughs> and any gentlemen in the house. 1.8. This 15-year-old was functioning like a first grader in the eighth month with his sound-based decoding. Talk about a cracked foundation. No wonder he was struggling. And he really needed this information a lot earlier. It was, it's, we were able to turn it around, but it's somewhat tragic that it had to be hit in his freshman year that he finally got it turned around because a lot of his identity was already formed as who he was as a student and, and his habits and his exposure to print. So, we did the same thing with him that I did with that fourth grade girl. Lots of switch it with um, very challenging five or six sound words. Read it and sort it. And if you don't know what I'm talking about uh, and you're new here to Reading Simplified, welcome. Uh, go to readingsimplified.com forward slash start dash here to learn more about those activities. We teach just a, a core couple of activities that solve that sound-based decoding problem so that kids can recognize words rapidly, they become fluent, and comprehension is not a problem. And that's generally what happens. So this child did that. He got switch it, read it, and a lot of sort it. He did a lot of um, challenging reading with coaching from me and his mom, and he also did rereading because I was concerned about that, um, that low average reading rate as well. So I worked with him a little longer, 12 hours, and I don't even, I, I tested it and I, I've triple checked this score, but he went up 11 grade equivalents on the passage comprehension for the Woodcock Johnson. So he had been functioning like a fifth grader. After the 12 hours, he was functioning like a 16th grader in the ninth month. That's like college. In other words, his brain was super capable of reasoning and understanding language but with the, the total breakdown in his system with all those holes, he wasn't successful. So once we solved this, that shored up that foundation, then comprehension was just a, a breeze for him. I actually didn't focus much on comprehension other than to ask him, so what was this text about at the end of reading it? We really focused on decoding because word attack was his main problem. And that happens over and over and over again. When I get students who have, um, I've been identified as having learning disabilities or dyslexia or um, are struggling or are behind or frustrated or unmotivated. They have poor word attack. It's based on their poor sound-based decoding. We shore that up and everything in the system goes up. And his word attack also went up very significantly. It went up right to grade level. Um, tent, Based, well, yeah, it did went just past the grade level because he was a ninth grader and it went to 10.0. So that's why I really want to make, uh, you know, hit this home, have, have it hit home for you today that um, giving the word attack test can be life changing for anyone who's struggling. And it's also still important for those kids who are in K 
first and second or your your year one, year two, or year three. <clears throat> it's important for them because they can be clipping along just fine, memorizing high frequency words. And the, if the foundation's not strong, it's masked. It can be masked for quite a while. Usually students come to me in third grade or fourth grade because that foundation was cracked and they can't keep memorizing those words. So I encourage you to consider giving this test or some variation on the tests that are available here at this blog post and see what you'll find. And if you've got kids with low nonsense word reading, low word attack, then zero in on that. Focus on teaching them sound-based decoding and activities like switch it, read it, and sort it. Reading challenging texts with the teacher's support and then rereading will change that dynamic rapidly. Some kids, uh, on average, I get kids uh, with this profile of low word attack, I get them to grade level, actually beyond grade level, in about 12 hours of instruction on average. Of course, some kids with some more significant learning differences will take longer, but we are not talking about something where kids cannot move for years. These students with when you find out this is their profile they can move they can move pretty quickly if you find these activities like switch it and sort it particularly so Debbie pops in with her grandson likes nonsense word switch it because he says it's not as scary because they're not real words awesome he doesn't worry about getting the words wrong that's interesting yes generally I don't recommend teaching nonsense words particularly for young kids because they have plenty of real words to read. But when our kids get older and we want to challenge their phonemic processing, having them do switch it, let's change like a nonsense word, strost to straunt. That really forces them to pay attention to sounds. It makes them hear um, individual sounds and words and they have to pull out the wrong sound and plug in the right sound. That's a flexibility, a mental flexibility that is a hallmark of good word readers. And so Switch It does that in spades. Are there any questions or comments about this? If you've never given this word attack test or you haven't seen this data, it may be kind of hard to believe. It, um, or maybe you're thinking, oh, I've got just the kid. I know who could, uh, I can give this test to tomorrow. What do you, you ladies and gentlemen say? So far, I think it's mostly ladies. This test, this test, um, I have a couple different freebies there. Um, they're not all mine, and most of them aren't. In fact, and the, the first two nonsense word tests are from other sites, and they're not um, really rigorously norm referenced, but they still are pretty good, and for free, it's a pretty good proxy to see if you have that gap with your students. There's some other tests that are really helpful beyond the classic comprehension test because as we started off this show with, comprehension is, um, giving a comprehension measure is kind of like getting your temperature. Maybe the student, the patient who has a, a fever has an ear infection, but maybe the, the patient with the fever has the flu. And just the the taking the temperature doesn't really get to the source of the problem. We've got to give the right test. And a word attack test is often, 99% of the time for me as a reading tutor, tutor, is the test that is the the one that pinpoints the main problem. All the others are definitely helpful. I, I can get I give a full comprehensive battery, but really if you're you know in a hurry and you just want to kind of quickly figure out as a screen, is there something here that I'm missing? Give that word attack test and you'll be surprised. Um, okay, let's see. Ileana says her daughter struggles with phonemic awareness. We started Switch It and she likes it. Very good. Have you been able to increase the difficulty, Ileana? Not just say with three sound like CVC, but move to, move to CVCC words. I can't remember where you were with that. And Debbie already did the two tests you linked us to before, and, and awesome, okay, great. Was it helpful, Debbie? And Leah asked, do you think a time fluency is important for students who are just reading accurately without being timed? Oh, great question, and I talk about it on this post. Um, so, when kids are in um, kindergarten, first and second, um, <clears throat> those first three years, fluency, 
isn't the primary goal. It can be helpful to do occasionally, but first it's really important to know that they're reading accurately so that they, um, you're checking that their sound-based decoding is strong and that their accuracy rate is that they're recognizing words. And then those two things are what fluency is based on. So if they're in that process of learning how to decode and um, learning to recognize words accurately, fluency is a second of a secondary concern. Now, once you've shored up the, the foundation with um, good sound-based decoding and the, their word identification skills are starting to come along, then fluency can become more of an important marker. So let me show that to you, um, if I can find that on our streamlined pathway. For those of you who know our streamlined pathway here at Reading Simplify, we just have really just one page that is like a scope and sequence for how to think about reading development, how to place kids, and how to, how to um, plan our instruction. So I'm going to pull that up and show you how that relates to your question, Leah. I think I'm going to pull it up. Okay. So here is the streamlined pathway. And for steps 1 through 12, we are focused on um, getting students to be able to blend and manipulate three or four sound words. We're getting them to be able to read phonics knowledge. These colored steps, you can't read it very well, but these are phonics, uh, pieces of phonics information. Over here on the right are high frequency sight words. They do need a good chunk of those to get started. So we're working on all these decoding skills and recognizing words by sight. And then once we've done all that work that shores up the sound-based decoding foundation, then fluency is um, either attained or then it becomes our next most pressing need. So initially, like in steps one through 12, really, uh, their blending, their word attack, their phonics knowledge, one of those things is going to be their most pressing need. And then once those things have been taught and they're sticking, then fluency often is the next most pressing need. I hope that makes sense. Okay, Ileana, um, it's a good question. She's interested in getting access to this particular document. I think you can get it here. And if you can't get it here, message um, my the Reading Simplified page and we will uh, share that with you. So this is where you can find that, uh, that streamlined pathway. So it's like one page to think about how reading develops, how to plan your instruction, and fluency is really the, the outcome of developing a person who's good at word identification. Okay, Debbie, back to you. You said uh, those two tests were helpful. Yes, um, and I always think, what, what is GS? Is this a girl, your second girl? I don't remember the, the abbreviation. So this child did better on the nonsense, as I said, because, he, oh, it's a he, he, grandson. That's what it is. I'm sorry, Debbie, because he wasn't afraid of getting the, the word wrong. So there was not much as much guessing. Oh, right, right. It was a more of a true picture of his letter sound recognition, absolutely, because he can't be dependent on having seen it and memorizing it from a visual perspective. <clears throat> okay, yeah, thank you, Debbie. I, I knew that was grandson. Just blipped out on camera. Um, and Liliana says about her daughter, she did not move up on a reading level for more than six months. Yes, when they don't budge, it's almost inevitably because this, the foundation of the sound symbol um, import uh, the sound symbol foundation is not really strong. So when they can't match sound and symbol really well, and when they hear the word strong, they can't quickly think st or ah, uh, mm, st or ah. Uh, yeah, they can't get how each of those sounds maps onto a particular f symbol or phonics uh, uh, spelling. Then um, there, it's like they lack the Velcro in their brain for this stuff to stick. So I definitely think that test will be very helpful for that little lady, Ileana. And uh, let us know if you need some more help getting um, her moving. 
So thanks for tuning in. If you know people that would benefit from giving this test, um, they may be classroom teachers, they may be um, special education teachers, they may be homeschooling parents, anyone who teaches beginning reading or any student who is a striving reader, this um, blog post will give them some information that they're probably not getting in their mainstream school-based assessment. And it may open their eyes to see what the true source of the problem is. So thanks for tuning in. We go live almost every Tuesday night here at Reading Simplified at 8 p.m. Eastern, sharing how to streamline your classroom instruction and accelerate students' reading achievement. So I look forward to seeing you again next week. Make sure you have turned on your notifications so if when we go live, you will be alerted. Thanks for tuning in.